Hi guys, welcome back to the Max Spence Business Podcast. Today I have a very special guest, but before I jump into that, if you guys like the content I'm putting out, the people I'm interviewing, please like, subscribe, leave a review. It helps out a ton with the podcast and also the people that are coming on the show. Um, so without further ado, today's guest is Steve Cody. So Steve is a well-known Canadian entrepreneur. He actually started his journey when he was 15 years old, um, pretty much with $1,200, a squeegee, a bucket, and a dream, which I absolutely love. <laughs> Um, some companies that you probably you know know them from recently is Ruckify and the Better Software Company. Um, but the two companies we're actually going to be talking about today is Bunking and Bunking Ventures. Uh, Steve was actually on a previous podcast beforehand. I'll actually link it in the description below so that you can you know check that out. Uh, but yeah, it's great to have you on the show today, Steve. Thank you very much, Max. Awesome, awesome. So yeah, why don't we jump right into this? Um, for people that have maybe never heard of Bunking, because I know you guys are a bit of like in stealth mode right now. Yeah. Um, you know what is Bunking? Bunking, and then what is Bunking Ventures? Uh, I mean, you know, to explain Bunking, I think probably explaining how I came up with the idea maybe explains it best, if that's, do we yeah. have time for that? Yeah, yeah 100%. So, uh, you know, for me, it started last year when I heard about, uh, like I heard Elon Musk talk about Starlink and how he'd have the whole planet connected by 2025 with internet, which meant you know, you could be anywhere and you could literally be connected to the internet. So when I heard that, I just thought, uh, I, I mean, I was building Ruckify at the time. I wasn't thinking of doing anything else, but I said, man, if I ever do anything else, it's going to ride in those coattails because that would change everything. Uh, and then earlier this year, uh, son and daughter, so 23 and 26, uh, they wanted to go to Tofino to live, surf, play, work for three months. Uh, the only problem was it was 6000 a month to rent a, an Airbnb in Tofino, which they really couldn't afford. So I said, you know, I said, like, why don't you rent out that Airbnb? Um, then go to Facebook Marketplace, go to Craigslist and rent out the couch, rent out a room, you know, just rent out some space. And uh, you get enough people, you kind of li you might live for free. And, uh, you know, then we started talking about it and they're like, well, you know, we don't know what kind of people we're going to get. Are they going to be, you know, bad people? How are they going to pay? So all these concerns started coming up and we, then we started talking about, okay, well, when we built Ruckify, you know, when you sign up to Ruckify, we know if you have a criminal record, we know if you have bad credit, we know if you're using a burner phone, we're doing a social scan. So 6% of the people who try to get on Ruckify can never get on, but that's meant there's never been an insurance claim. Mm -hmm. So we said, you know, there's got to be something like that for like a shared living environment and looked around, couldn't find anything that actually did that. Um, so that was interesting. Uh, and then my daughter, she's a TikTok influencer. She started saying, well, if we're going to live in this house and we're going to have other people living in it, like I want to live with other TikTokers. I want to do like collaborative living. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, well, that was interesting. And then my son, he's a product manager. He's like, well, I don't have an office to go to anymore. So I want to live with developers or other technical people so I can learn or I can mentor. So that would be, you know, to me, that was like, wow, theme living. So that was kind of cool. So started putting it together and then I came up with an idea. I said, okay, I think I have a way for you to get to Tofino. I said, how about we create this marketplace called Bunking? Uh, you go to Airbnb, you rent that place for 6,000 a month, come back to bunking.com one of you becomes the host or the organizer. So say Katrina is the host. Um, she creates a bunking pod. And she said, my pod, she says like my pod is for eight people. Uh, the rules of my pod are you can't have a criminal record. You need good credit. There's no smoking. And then the characteristics of my pod are like we're all under 30. You know, we like to have a drink at night. Uh, but we're all in bed by 11. We all like to get up early. So kind of really connecting like-minded people and then she said well and this is a TikToking pod so it kind of gives it a theme mm -hmm. so now you're really connecting like-minded people and then if anybody's thinking of joining the pod they get to see everybody else's profile so they also get to make a decision right whether yeah. or not they're people they want to join mm -hmm. and then in the pod they can say we have two couches available you can rent those by the night we have two shared rooms you can rent those by the week however they want to configure it and that's kind of how bunking works Wow, uh, that's actually really cool. So pretty much it was it was like your your son and your daughter that sort of like pushed forward the the idea of like you're like hey why don't I solve this problem, yeah. uh, you know f f for my kids, which I find really really interesting. So 
that that was sort of the inception of the idea um when when did it sort of happen you were like um let, let's actually like let's get the groundwork going let's actually like i'm gonna put more thought and effort into this was this after you left ruckify and bunking yeah all uh, this came up after i had left ruckify uh, so okay. we're literally thinking like what am i gonna do next i knew it kind of had to do with like starlink and elon so mm -hmm. you know kind of a working remotely or living remotely or you know i knew it was going to be something like that mm -hmm. but kind of i didn't the stars aligned and when these problems came up and you know kind of saw that nobody else had really solved the problem we literally started right away ah okay okay yeah, that's pretty interesting so for for bunking and bunking ventures i'm really interested to hear because you guys are in, like you're in the trenches the beginning stages of this company right um so how are you approaching the marketing for bunking and bunking ventures uh, you know, I mean, we don't have a, a full blown out plan right now. Uh, we've got to see kind of what the market wants. Uh, when we started bunking, I mean, we spent probably the first two and a half, three months just doing design thinking. So we're a tech company, but we didn't hire like one developer until we were probably about three months in. So we did a lot of research you know we did a lot of and s sorry yeah. to interrupt you there but who, who was actually involved with that uh you know that beginning was that just you was that like you and your family or was that you and a part uh, business partner it really started out with myself my two daughters um yeah we were the three that really got it started uh, wow. my son joined us later uh he's a product manager and then we just started adding people like i think we're probably around 15 people oh, a wow. lot of them part-time mm -hmm. uh, mind you uh, but that's about the size of the team right mm -hmm. now. So started with a lot of design thinking, and we had that experience from building Rockify, uh, which really is a lot of research. Uh, you know, you're mocking the UI, the UX, or interactive mocks. You get to go back out, test different groups of people. What do they like? What do they not like? What do we need to change? And you get all that work done before you hire a developer. Yeah. So okay, you know, yeah. that, that's really what we did. Uh, so now, you know, the way we're building it out, we kind of, it's in phases. So right now we're, we're building what we call is our MVP. We think it's going to be a really good MVP. Um, and and so, so, sorry, yeah. sorry to interrupt you again. Uh, but so a MVP, what, what does that like stand for, for people that are maybe watching that I've never heard of? Like a know? minimum viable product. Ah, okay. So, okay. but I, you know, I, I mean, you can call it like phase one release it's not i wouldn't consider it a minimum viable product because there's been a lot of work and a lot of research that's gone into it a lot of tech companies and we've done it before you know you have an idea you scratch it on the back of a napkin you hire a developer and you start building mm -hmm. well then you're iterating you know and innovating kind of as you're building if you do design thinking ahead of time you're going to save yourself a lot of time and a lot of money down the road it's a lot more time up front but you know you have less mm -hmm. le code legacy and just a, a lot less rework so i think by the time we deliver the mvp we'll likely be about 70 percent there i think mm -hmm. we'll be about 70 percent right and i think you know a lot of companies when you're delivering tech uh, and you're delivering that mvp you're kind of about 30 or 40 percent right so uh, okay. you know so we'll deliver the mvp then what we're going to do is we're going to collect data uh, we're going to have real users using it. So we'll let that kind of bake for two or three months. And then we're going to go get our design thinking team going back over the features uh, and, you know, redesigning or tweaking or whatever we need to do to get better conversions. Uh, uh, okay. And once that happens, then you start to think about marketing, real marketing and real scale. Because uh, uh, okay. there's no point spending, you know, 20000 a month on Facebook if yeah. your sign up conversions are like 10% less than they could be. Ah, right? okay. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, like 100% and and that like that most likely comes from your experience, right? Literally. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We learned the hard way. <laughs> yeah, cuz yeah. I, I was just thinking about that and I was like if if I was going to like start this, I I would probably make like all those mistakes yeah, yeah. going yeah, into we've this. We've been there done that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we laugh. So uh so is is have you actually started a, another company with your family before is this like your first company that your kids are like really involved in and like how, how, how does that make you feel to have like your, your your children involved with what you're doing or have they been involved in past companies? yeah they pretty much i mean we've had 16 companies and you know i mean obviously when they were too young they you know before they were born they weren't involved or when they were too young but i know you know i'm thinking back to like 
Cody party rentals, you know, they'd be cleaning dishes when they had to get clean for Christmas and New Year's and turnover. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, they were probably six, seven, eight years old. You know, when we did Monster Halloween, they totally loved that. But, you know, they're receiving product, they're pricing product, and, you know, they're early teens, I would say, at that point. So, yeah, mm -hmm. always been involved. So, ah, okay, you know, awesome. as much as we can. Yeah. So. Awesome. 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 So um, another question I have for you, actually, is because you must have like, you know, during these past like year, you've been doing tons of research on this and from like learning, like seeing what Elon Musk is doing. Um, you know, for people that are listening that are entrepreneurs, how can they sort of take advantage of the work from home uh, environment that's building? Like uh, I've seen a LinkedIn post that you, you were saying that I can't remember the exact amount, but that industry sector was growing and that like uh, like an insane rate because like, you know, a lot of big companies were putting people you know, being like, oh, you can work from home now. We're actually, you know, you're only can, it's a remote work right now, right? So wh what do you think, like, can you actually talk a little bit about that? Like what's happening in that sector? Uh, and where do you think like the work from home environment is going? Do you think like, you know, in 25 years, like the like 90% of companies are going to be all remote or do you think it's going to be like in a different trajectory? Yeah, I mean, maybe first off, I would say like from an entrepreneur's standpoint, uh, the ability to be able to talk to somebody in South Africa, UK, Toronto, Vancouver, like all in the same day in 30 minute chunks is unbelievable, yep. right? So just the amount of people you can connect with to learn if you're raising money or whatever you're doing. I literally just telling my wife like the other day, like I absolutely love it. So, you know, from that standpoint, it's great. Uh, from working, I mean, I'm just, really using my own experience and if I think back to Ruckify uh, we were growing in North America we had a team in North America and we had remote people and it was like really hard to have a hybrid team because the default was the office mm -hmm. so then it was like they were you know the remote people were never really integrated we spent a lot of money flying them in putting them in hotels trying to get them to connect with the team but we could never really get it working. So, you know, we kind of said, like, this remote thing didn't work for us. And when COVID hit, I can remember, like, you know, like, I thought, man, we are going to be in trouble. We were about 80 people at the time. And, uh, like, everybody's got to be remote. And, like, how the hell is this going to work? And I can still remember the first team meeting we had was on Zoom. And I'd never been on Zoom before. But when I could see everybody's faces and everybody's smiles and everybody's eyes... Like, man, I said, we are going to be okay. And, you know, what we did is we put together a plan in terms of just making sure that everybody connected every day. Uh, and then teams connected so many times a week. And as a unit, we connected. And I literally think we became a better company, a more disciplined company because of it. Wow. Um, and now when I look at, like, uh, you know, I'm, I look at what's happening today, you know, it's like some people say, yeah, we're going back to the office and, and I'm thinking, okay, like, what does that mean? Like, are you really prepared to show up on Monday morning at 9 a.m., leave at 5, and do that right until Friday? Like, I, there's not a lot of people really willing to do that anymore. Yeah. So then it becomes, you hear people talk about hybrid. Oh, you only need to come in three days a week. Okay, well, that's going to be interesting because, you know, why do you go in? You go in to connect with other people. You go into like, you know, because your buddies work there. Well, you're going to show up and your buddies aren't going to be there. And mm -hmm. to have a meeting it's going to have to be digital by default or it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I don't think so yeah. you're going to, you know, the meet, the meetings will all be done over zoom in the office. So I don't know, yeah. like, uh, you know, then it's like, well, why am I at the office? Right. What, what, like I could be doing this from somewhere else. And I think when we think about bunking, we think about creating the third office mm -hmm. because I think connecting with people, having collisions, uh, interacting, especially if you're new in a company, like that's critical you have to do that and like that really can't happen you know when a meeting starts at nine and finishes at nine thirty. Yeah. so you know i see us uh like a lot of companies hosting bunking pods mm -hmm. uh having workers go to bunking pods mm -hmm. spend a week two weeks a month who knows you yeah. know like different cohorts going in mm -hmm. and not only is that good like i don't know about you but Man, I think what, when we were in the scaffolding rental business, we'd charter planes and we'd bring customers up for fly-in fishing trips. Oh, wow. And I could see those customers today that went on those trips and we like we're buddies, like we're real friends because, you know, we woke up with messy hair, 
we ate breakfast, we got drunk together. They yeah. were the best relationship. So yeah. imagine if coworkers mm -hmm. start doing that. Yeah. Like, man, you are going to have a really good team. Mm -hmm. So anyways, that's kind of where I yeah. see it going. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I actually really agree with that. Like, while you were saying that, I was like, because, you know, like a lot of workplaces will do like, let's say a week retreat to yeah. somewhere and you're just combining those two things into one. Um, and everybody's yeah. excited. Well, yeah. do this all the time. Yeah. To make so it part of life. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah. I, I, I think it's, it's going to be really interesting because um, I, I think the company's going to do really well. Um, but so what, what's sort of your, your end goal with, with these two, you know, like bunking and bunking ventures? Like what, what's like the end vision for these two companies? Well, I mean, bunking is it's really a social platform, right, that connects like minded people for shared living opportunities. So we're leveraging kind of existing in accommodations inventory that's out there. Could be a yacht, could be a, a house, could be an RV, you know, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. uh, my personal goal uh, with bunking is, um, you know, and, and we're going to create a fund, like it's an, called an off-the-grid fund, is where we want to raise money for communities that are off the grid. And I don't know about you, but I've had a lot of friends go to Cuba. Mm -hmm. And they meet the people in Cuba, and they love the people in Cuba, and they keep sending stuff back to Cuba to help that community. So basically, yeah. they went to Cuba, and they left their hearts behind. I think with bunking, if we could ignite these off-the-grid communities, if we could get people to stay in these communities, stay with local people, not only will they be paying to do it, but they're going to leave their hearts behind, which mm -hmm. means they're going to continue helping those communities. Yeah. So... You know, like we don't talk about that really as part of our vision, but my yeah. personal goal is to do a lot of that because I think yeah. if, you know, we can help a lot of people who need help, mm -hmm. you know, by with bunking. So that's yeah. kind of, I had a buddy who went to a Callowit, uh, paid $750 a night to stay in a Callowit, stayed at a hotel. Wow. I don't know. Imagine if could have paid half, lived with a family, you know, got to know them, you know, mm -hmm. eat local food, whatever, have probably had a way better experience, but... You know, wouldn't it just been the three hundred and fifty or the seven fifty that he would have paid the family? He would have remembered that family. You mm -hmm. know, coming back he, anyway. So I, yeah. I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Yeah, cool. awesome, awesome. So, um, yeah, so, so to pretty much carry on from that. Um, so it seems really interesting that like, is that like something in the future? Like, do you want to start like a bunking f like foundation, like yeah. charity? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, type. Okay, awesome, yeah, awesome. Yeah. So a portion of every transaction, you know, would go towards that. So we could put money. You know, we see an opportunity to help somebody off the grid and a little bit of money could make it possible for them to offer a bunking opportunity. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll help them. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. And then just sort of talk a little bit about uh, bunking, bunking ventures. Can you actually go into a little bit of detail? Because I, I know that's like a more like real estate side of the business. Yeah. Right. So how, how are you sort of operating in that and who's sort of involved with that sort of team? Yeah, so, I mean, Bunking Ventures really, it wasn't planned from the beginning. It was really about the tech. Uh, and then we had people reaching out to us saying, oh, you know, like, when is this app going to be ready? You know, we have this real estate. We'd love to do shared living because we can make a heck of a lot more money than we can, you know, renting out three bedrooms plus a basement than to a family. And anyway, so started having those conversations Then started, th and then we started kind of looking more at destination locations like if you look in the city the stats will show if you convert a house from a traditional rental revenue model to shared living you know you're going to get kind of 32 to 46 percent more revenue mm -hmm. on a monthly basis which is significant uh, but then when you started looking at destination locations it was actually more uh, so I don't know we just had the, an idea to say okay well we're building this tech that never existed that's going to help facilitate shared living and connect like-minded people uh we're building this community of like-minded people and then we're starting to collect data so if we took all that and we started buying real estate uh in destination locations you know we can obviously leverage the tech to make it happen uh, i think more importantly then we can leverage the community so when we have the community so say we buy real estate in greece uh, a lot of destination locations people go there because of weather so mm -hmm. greece they call it head and shoulders you know like they have a peak season they have a down season and they have a hard time filling beds in the down season we think what we can do is because we have this community which is interest-based 
uh, 12 categories, about 110 subcategories of interests. So yoga, foodie, accessibility, religion. So all these categories are subcategories. We can take these places. We know we can have them filled when the, you know, in, in the high season. But in the low season, we can kind of reposition the properties, and it could be like a yoga retreat, right? Oh, wow. So people are going there living because of an interest, not because of the weather. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so anyways, we think we have a we have a huge advantage because we get to go buy real estate, convert it to shared living, which will inter- like immediately get, get us more revenue. Uh, and then we can refinance based on that, use that money, give it half of it back to our partners, half of it to fund our tech company. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we know we can do that. And then we think we can get keep the beds filled uh, longer. Uh, than traditional businesses so yeah oh, okay. that's awesome awesome yeah that, that, that's actually really interesting so you're sort of like um like that, that that's such a smart way to do it right instead of like having to wait like i, I know you already said there's an interest out there and, and like for real estate investors right like to do the shared living but you're like you guys are being the proactive and actually building this system out already so it's like it's going to add and then like you're saying it's it's going to like add a ton more revenue to to the business right yeah. and real estate always always does really well usually yeah exactly <laughs> and stuff, so. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah i mean they're they're saying it's that yeah. i mean destination real estate they're saying is the next big thing yeah. and what's igniting it is kind of this work from anywhere mm-hmm. right so wow well, like why don't i want to go live in costa rica for a couple of months and then bounce yeah. over to wherever so <laughs> yeah. you know it sounds pretty good <laughs> yeah 100 percent. so uh I, I got i have another question here uh it's a little bit more personal i, I think you answered it a little bit on the last podcast but i, I just want to go a little bit more in depth uh i've actually seen it a lot on um uh, sort of tiktok and like other things and stuff so and there's probably people that w- are interested to see like you know h- how you sort of did it so um like h- how how do like how did you make your first million dollars in business if, if you are fine answering that well like do you mean revenue or like in my pocket? Yeah, like like kept 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 to yourself. Like, and kept, what was that feeling like when yeah, you yeah. did that? Oh, that's, yeah, so that's an interesting one. I mean, so I started when I was young. I started a window cleaning company. My mom was a house cleaner. I mean, we moved like twelve times. You know, when I was young, so we we, we had no money. So uh, starting a business was just really about surviving. And then once I started, I I mean, I had a goal, and my goal was was to be a millionaire, which was a big deal back then. Uh, by the time I was thirty. Uh, so we had built and sold several companies and always kind of used the money to build the next company. And uh, we ended up selling our lift business, so booms and scissor lifts. Uh, so these are the machines that go up in the air. We sold it to Hertz, which was owned by the Ford Motor Company at the time. They were, they were the biggest uh, equipment rental company in the world at that time. Uh, they bought us, and the deal was to get signed literally on my 30th birthday. Wow. <laughs> uh, so their head office was in New York. Yeah. And at that time, like, we were way too cheap to, to, to get on a plane. So we drove to New York. Mm-hmm. My wife had planned a surprise birthday party for me. And I had to say, like, I'm going to be in New York signing this deal. Uh, so anyways, we signed the deal. Uh, and I got back, I think it was about 1 in the morning for my, uh, for my uh, surprise party. I didn't have the cash in my hand, but the deal was signed, and yeah. it was for many, many million dollars. So, anyways, it all kind of worked out pretty good. Wow. <laughs> yeah, crazy, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that, that That's awesome that, like, you, you had the vision, and you sort of, like, um, what's the word for it? It's like... Uh, it's, it's like when you set a goal and you envision it and it's yeah. like you, you get uh, literally on yeah. that day, like yeah. literally on that day. That, yeah. So. Ma- manifested it. Yeah. yeah manifestation. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's absolutely incredible. Uh, and what, what was that? Like, what was that feeling? Was it like, like to actually hit one of those momentum goals, like in your life? It was really cool. I mean, I can remember the feeling on the drive back. Like it was, the money wasn't in the bank, so it's never done till it's done. But yeah. Man, it felt good, and I can literally still remember going to the bank machine uh, and printing out the slip, like, you know, (laughs) just to see how many, you know, like, to see (laughs) what my bank balance was. So, because it all just went into my checking account to begin with, and I I literally still remember that. So, that was very cool. Wow, awesome, awesome. And and, and what what was, like, once you did that, what was your, did you, like, do a good, like, did you do a crazy purchase or something like that, or, like, what what, what did you do with, like, did you? Yeah, I bought a, like, yeah, I did, I, I. I only did one. I bought a, and I'm not even into cars, but I bought a Porsche Boxster at the time. Oh, okay. Uh, I think I only kept it for a year because I never drove it, really didn't care about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know what? 
taught me something about entrepreneurship because I took the next year off. And what I learned is now I had something and I was scared to lose it. Oh, wow. So it's actually, it's and I, and I see it with other entrepreneurs. I had yeah. a partner, you know, he was scared to lose his reputation and he would not take risk and anyways do bizarre things yeah. uh, at risk of losing something. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, it just kind of got me to the point where you had to kind of shake mm -hmm. like, you know, that you, it's okay to go back to zero. Mm -hmm. uh, it kind of had to shake that. And it took us losing our son to kind of get back to that. Oh, I'm sorry. To uh, hear that. Many years later. But yeah. So if you have nothing to lose, I think it's actually a hell of a lot easier to build a company. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, psychologically. Because mm -hmm. if, if you're trying to protect something, you're not all in. Yeah. Yeah. hundred uh, percent. And that's actually super interesting because um, I've, I've watched other podcasts and uh, a lot of guys like at one <laughs> podcast that I watch is called Impulsive, which is a very big. It has like Logan Paul and, you know, a very big creator on it. And it was interesting. He was actually talking about this. It's like the, like every s sort of every level you go up. It's like interesting because it's like new things you have to deal with, right? Because at the beginning, it's like you have nothing to lose. Yeah. But, you know, there's a little bit of self-doubt of like, are you going to make it? Is yeah. it going to happen? All that type of stuff. And then you get there and then it's like, okay, I got something to lose now. And it's like, well, am I going to be able to take the same risks? You know, there's new like distractions that come into your life because you have the money. And like may maybe like on his his uh, side, it was like the fame and stuff. So there's new distractions he had to deal with, um, you know, with life and traveling because he had that ability and how to you know, he had to still maintain to stay focused in what he was doing to like sort of get past that and move forward. So it's, it's, it's really interesting that it's like, you know, e even like when you think like, you know, you make it to the top or whatever, right? There's, there's, there's always still more. There's always yeah. somebody yeah. like, yeah. you know, another level. I, yeah. Like you just, I don't know, like it's, for me, it's never about money. Mm -hmm. It's about the journey. Mm -hmm. It's about building things. It's about, yeah. you know, bringing people along the ride. Yeah. Um, yeah, and you know, and, and you know, just try to think about like you know, even like making a social post. You know, if some people that are like they're scared they're gonna not say the right thing, or I don't know, like they're gonna offend somebody. Like they've got something to lose, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know. Like it's, I think it's you're almost putting handcuffs on as yeah. an entrepreneur if you're operating on that basis. And I've seen yeah. it, literally, I've lived it, and uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I like that a lot. So sort of going to the opposite end of that, like having all that enjoyment, uh, what was one of your like scariest days in business um, that you experienced with one of your companies or, or like stressful? Uh, yeah, you know what? Probably, you know, we had uh, 275 Slater, so that's in Ottawa. It's a high-rise building. I think it's 22 stories tall. Uh, this is many, many years ago, but, uh, we had a call, I don't know, uh, from an employee to say our window washers were on a swing stage. So, you know, two people on a platform that hangs from the building. I think there were about 16 floors up at the time and one of the cables let go. And, uh, so that kind of meant everything on the platform crashed to the ground. Um, the fire, I mean, the firemen, like they literally shut, closed downtown Ottawa at the time. Um, I didn't know if, you know, one of our guys was killed, you know, was he dangling? The, the two guys ended up dangling 16 floors above the ground. Uh, the firemen, you know, went up through the building. They broke the windows, brought the guys in. Uh, one guy was, you know, hurt, not hurt badly, but hurt enough. I think both you know, mentally, like, they, you yeah. know, they were very shooken up. And, yeah, I think to me that was just real. And, and back then, I mean, we didn't have cell phones and, mm -hmm. you know, like we didn't have the communication that we have today. Yeah. Uh, I definitely saw it on the news. Uh, it wasn't our fault. It was the building, like, the, uh, the there's a the, the steel lot. cable. Yeah. yeah, the nut came out. Oh, um, wow. An engineer had inspect that it had to be welded. Um, yeah, I... I'd really think that's probably one of the worst days of my yeah. life because you don't know if people are dead or alive or, yeah. you know, that's our people working for us, people on the ground. So yeah. Yeah. Very scary. Yeah, to like, 
yeah, that, 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 that's that's a that's a crazy story. And whole, like, uh, luckily, ever, everybody made made it out alive, yep. right? Yeah. Um. But yeah, like that. That's like as probably like like you're saying as an entrepreneur, like because you have like people's lives in your hands, and because it's like you know, um, you know, with your business, right? You're like giving them a paycheck or whatever, like providing for their family and stuff. When something like that happens, that must be like like huge. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Window I, cleaning I, I, was yeah. scary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Scaffolding was scary. Yeah. 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 So that that must have been crazy. Pretty crazy. Um. But yeah, to sort of transition from that, um, so to sort of give advice, uh, l- let's say like, you, you know, y- y- your kids are involved with your business now, but let's say one of your kids came to you and said, hey, you know, hey, dad, I, I want to start this new business um, and, you know, blah, 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 or whatever it might be. What sort of like, what would you say to them and what would be your advice to them? Uh, do it. <laughs> do it. <laughs> like, you know, and, and like, I don't know. There's not a lot of businesses that can't succeed, I don't mm-hmm. think. Um, you know, like you think of Michael Dell starting a business of selling computers only over the internet when nobody was on the internet. Like, think about, you know, that's a pretty crazy idea, right? Yeah. Um, you know, it's just always kind of finding a way to make it happen. Yeah. So if any of my kids came up to me, it'd be like, okay, hey, well, when are you starting? So, yeah. you know, because that's probably the biggest problem is actually starting. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah uh, I, I actually agree with that because, uh, like, that that's something that I've sort of dealt with in, in my own life is just like execution is like everything. Yeah. Um, and and it's it's actually funny because like when I was at Algonquin, one of the, like like my my first like semester there, one of the professors actually told me that he's like he's like he's like all these ideas. He says it doesn't matter. He says the only thing that's important is like you just need to execute. That's the most important thing because he says you can have amazing ideas, but if you don't actually just sit down and do it, he yeah. says it's never going to come to fruition. Yeah, so. and don't overthink it. Yeah. You know, I see people, oh, my God, this could go wrong, that could go wrong. I don't know. Like, my first business was window cleaning. I definitely didn't overthink it because when I started, I found out I was scared of heights. So, <laughs> like, <laughs> had I really thought about it, I'd have probably never started it, right? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, I mean, don't overthink it. You know, if, if you mm-hmm. think you can be passionate about it, uh, if you think people are actually going to pay you money to do it, you know, mm-hmm. that's really important. Otherwise, it's a hobby. Mm-hmm. Uh, go for it. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. I, I love that. Um, and sort of uh, uh, to expand on that, let's say if, if you could go back to your 15 year old self when you were first starting and you could give yourself one piece of advice about business and then one piece of advice about life, what would they be? Hey, hey, hey that's a yeah. You know what? I think in like if you look at well, probably business and life. Um, you know, look, surround yourself with people that are loyal and give the loyalty back because there's a lot of people in it for themselves and there's a lot of people, you know, kind of prepared to do not very nice things, uh, especially, I think, in the entrepreneurial world. Mm-hmm. Um, so the more people you can find along the way that you can totally trust, you have to give them the, t- the same trust. I mean, it's got to, you know, you have to earn wh- whatever you're getting back. Uh, but if you can find those people and really hang on to those people for your whole journey, it really pays off. And I think, yeah. you know, when I look at, you know, a person, uh, Terry Matthews, uh, is in Ottawa. Uh, if I look at the way he operates, it's all about loyalty um, at at at, an, at a cost, literally. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, there could be better talent out there. Uh, you know, you might find a smarter person. But if they're not yeah. loyal, you know, if they're up to something that's no good, all the smartness is not going to do you a lot of good. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah, uh, I, th- I don't know. Yeah, it's a good question, and I think... That's no, no, really I, about I, 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 I think that's a that's a great answer too. Like you know, it's like that's one of the most like like you're saying that's one of the most important things, right? It's like um, if if you're starting a business and you start with people and then something happens and they you know screw they o- screw you over or you know like with contracts or whatever like that stuff can always happen and it's always like a very terrible thing that can happen, right? Um, but like you were saying, is like surrounding s- yourself by people that you know you love and they love you and you know there's trust and like all that type of stuff is actually better than, you know, going for the smartest guy in the room. But, Big you time. know, in three years, he might just be like, oh, screw this guy. I'm going to rip out, you know, the business from under him and take half or Big something time. like that. Big time. Right. Yeah. Cause, yeah. Right, awesome. So 
to sort of carry on from that, um, you know, you've been in business for over 35 years. Uh, I don't know if that's that. I believe that's correct. Yeah. Or yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that, that, that's a long time to be in business. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so you you've ran a multitude of companies in different sectors, different industries. Um, so what like to give advice on that like what are sort of the basics of, like what what is business and what are the basics of business that you could give to somebody let's say uh you know a 20 year old or 19 year old that doesn't have any knowledge about business wants to start their own company and you know we're just looking at like what, what is a company and like why like how, how, how do you run one yeah uh you know i mean geez when i started window cleaning you know i so i mean i grew up with my mom she cleaned houses so i would go with her to clean a house and at the end of the cleaning job, there was typically cash or a check on the table. Like she got paid after every job. So I think for me starting window cleaning, it was kind of normal. I clean your windows. Now I'd like to get paid, right? Mm -hmm. So that was kind of felt normal to me. But I had like, I had no idea, like, how do I promote my business? Uh, you know, back then you'd have to kind of go to the library. There was just the yellow pages. Now there's all this information and there's like YouTube right? You, I mean, there's, there's mm -hmm. so much information on how to do anything uh, that, man, you, you have such an advantage. And I think you just have to be curious. Uh, mm -hmm. Try to just solve a problem. I mean, we started Cody Mobile auto detailing. That was only because my wife would get mad because our car was never, like I never w had time to go get it auto detailed. Mm -hmm. I solved the problem. So we created mobile auto detailing, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. And the people who do it love it. Um, so, you know, like look for a bunking, we're solving a problem. Ruckify, we solved the problem. Uh, mm -hmm. we, you know, we had, we needed a chainsaw and couldn't get one. Mm -hmm. Um, so look for a problem, uh, make sure people are willing to pay you to solve the problem and then just start doing it. Like it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be big. It could be really small. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I, 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 and to go back to what one thing that you said, like a lot of people get stuck in that sort of analysis paralysis is like yeah. a term that's get that's used a lot is like, uh, and I think like th there's the pro of like you know you have the internet, you have YouTube, you have all these, oh, uh, you have you have all these resources, but sort of you can get stuck into just watching video after video after video after video or reading reading blog after blog after blog and feel like you're doing something but actually not doing anything because you're actually not taking the first step of going out there and say you know knocking on somebody's door s shooting a message to somebody saying hey you know like can we help you with this or you know i can design this or whatever right yeah, yeah. i you know i think like what i talk about a lot is especially when you're starting out just create activity mm -hmm. so put a post on social i want to connect with other people that are doing x mm -hmm. start having conversations that's activity activity will equal momentum mm -hmm. and when you start building momentum momentum equals opportunity mm -hmm. right so you're going to find opportunity in that momentum yeah so i, I think actu it's actually activity it's equals momentum momentum equals opportunity that, that's and actually crazy you said that because like in, in my own like um like i, I run a, s a small like video editing agency right and it's actually funny because you said that because it's like that's something that i learned recently was yeah, yeah. like like it, the longer I just stay in this business and just continue just to keep moving forward, even though something might not be happening, it's really weird. It's like a conversation I had with somebody like four months ago. They come back to me and say, hey, you know, I need, you know, I need videos or I need this edited. Yeah. And it's just like weird. It's just like and then that one gets, you know, like one of the, another buddy I had was like, oh, you know, like he told somebody else to, you know, that was wanting to produce videos. He was like, hey, I got a, I got a guy that I know that can do that. And like linked linked us up and stuff and yeah. it's, it's just crazy that like it's like 100 percent true it's just like the momentum you build just creates other it's opportunities that flywheel that, right yeah 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 yeah, yeah. That, that's awesome that's that's so cool um so n now to actually a statistic i've sort of seen is um so 65 percent of companies uh go under before like year 10 which i, I was like that's that's pretty crazy right um and and the reason i wanted to ask you this was um you, you have eight companies that you've started that have actually got over the, you know, the, the 10 year mark. Um, so what, what do you think it takes for a company to have that long longevity and make it past, you know, the 10 year, the 20 year, the 30 year mark? You know, like if I look back at all the different ones that have made it 10 years, man, they've all got a tough story. Like mm -hmm. not one was easy. Mm -hmm. So it was literally perseverance and figuring it out like you don't know, think of think of window washing i'm scared of heights 
that's a pretty big problem when you're starting to clean yeah. windows, <laughs> right? So <laughs> what do I have to do? I have to hire people because I'm too scared to go up there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and, the, and I'm young, I'm 16. So now I got to hire everybody's older. So that's just a huge thing to overcome. Uh, have a swing stage fall in Ottawa with your name on it, right? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like that's, a, you know, so all these things, yeah, I mean, there's going to be huge obstacles and you just have to find a way to overcome them. And often you can actually turn them into advantages. So me hiring people because I couldn't clean windows, huge advantage because now I, you know, I got time to build the business. I was able to work on the business. I wasn't working in the business. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's always, uh, anyway, so you, you can typically turn an obstacle into an advantage. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but just find a way. Always find a way. There's always a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I actually, w one thing that you mentioned there that I thought was really interesting was um, when, when you start a business, it's like you, you don't need to actually do that like task or whatever it is. Let's say it's like, uh, you know, like the, the window cleaning, right? Like actually hire. And, th and I think like a lot of like younger people like my age uh, and it's something that I sort of realized uh, was like, you know, when you start a business, you think like, OK, I need to do it all myself, everything I have to do. And it has to be perfect. Um, but then you realize you're like, oh, I can actually outsource it to somebody else or bring it to somebody else and somebody else can do it, which then can allow me to, you know, sell more yeah. and work, you know, on marketing or whatever else. Right. And that's something that I learned. Uh, but th th that's actually crazy that, that you learned that at 16 years yeah, old. Yeah, had no choice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> I was like, I, I, when you said that, I was just thinking, I was like, I was like, this, like you, at 16, you must have been dealing with people that were probably like 20. Oh, I think or the like first guy I hired, I his name was Bob Lapin. I think he was 40. And he was a crusty guy. He scared the <laughs> hell out of me. So, yeah, you know, he, he, he must have been thinking in this head. He's like, he's like, what the hell is this kid doing? <laughs> Big time. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but but yeah, like the, the was there like uh, can you remember back to that? Like, was there any like like were you nervous or fearful of doing that for the first time? Or oh yeah, definitely. I yeah. mean, definitely, yeah, hugely intimidated. But I had no choice. Yeah. So you know what? I had to make money. Mm -hmm. uh, it was it wasn't about building a business. It was about literally just Making. you know getting income. Yeah. So yeah, and I had started this thing. That's up. I mean, that was my twelve hundred bucks. So, you, so you like it had ship. to work. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. you know, yeah, that's awesome. Um, so uh, another question I have here is uh, so this is a question that, well, th that I've seen a lot on the Internet and other things of that nature. Um, so like how, how do you find your passion and how do you find what you love to do in life? Uh, yeah, that's I mean. Uh, how do you find it, I guess? You know, you've got to, uh, it probably comes back to like take action equals momentum and momentum will equal opportunity and mm -hmm. opportunity could be your passion, right? So yeah. I wasn't, you know, when I started, I was definitely wasn't passionate about cleaning windows. Uh, I can't think of many businesses that I built that I was ever passionate about. What I was passionate about was the mechanics of building the building, almost mm -hmm. like an artist you know doing a painting mm -hmm. you know what i mean like yeah. bringing it together bringing the team together yeah like that that's my passion and i only found that out over time just from doing what i had to do yeah uh so if, i think if somebody is and there's a lot of people like sitting back saying well, like what is my passion you have to start doing things because if you do something and you start doing it really well it can turn into your passion when we when we did uh Ruckify, I, my son he was going Algonquin at the time I said well you gotta you gotta leave school you're gonna have to come and help us I mean, he was able to make a choice obviously uh, I, he said well, what, what do you need me for I said well you got to be a product manager and so I I've never been a product manager I like I don't I can't be a product manager I said no yeah that's we need that so you know can you please do it and he did it he did it really really well and now he loves it wow. so he's do you know what I mean yeah so was that his passion? Like, that's probably what he wants to do forever now. Wow. So. Yeah. So I, I, I guess it's like it's, a, it's actually funny because that's that's sort of similar to like, you know, figuring out what foods you like. Right. There's only one way to do it. Yeah. And you have to try. Yeah. You have to eat, you have to try and eat the food. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Like, that's the only way to do it. Um, so for, for yourself, was there ever a moment like aha, like an aha moment like that clicked in your head and you're like, oh, I, I love this. Like, this is what I love to do. And I want to do this for the next 5, 10, 15 years. Well, I love being an entrepreneur. So uh, to me, an entrepreneur means you build companies, you build them on the basis that you have nothing to lose. I think that's very important. 
Mm -hmm. And I'll do that like literally until my funeral, right? So there, I would not retire. Um, that's what I love to do. So I like to, yeah, and yeah, I mean, we've done it enough times. Like this time when I left Rockify, and I'm like, like, man, what am I going to do next? And I really, really struggled and it felt hard, but it literally only took me a couple of months to find bunking. And mm -hmm. it kind of happened, I remember it was a Monday morning and I kind of have my routine. I have coffee and I write notes on my phone and I'm like, geez, man, I, like I just couldn't figure it out. And then, you know, the conversation with the kids about the Fino, the themed living. Anyways, literally, literally within about 20 minutes, it was click, 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 click. It all came together, and <laughs> like that's one, bu like that's literally wow. how it happened. Yeah. So, yeah. Awesome, awesome. So. That's incredible. Uh, so like, w w w like during during your life and stuff, have have you ever had like uh like when you've made that transition, have you ever gone into like a depression or anything like that? Definitely. With, with d and how how did like you sort of like I, I know that you mentioned you sort of have a system in your morning you wake up you have your coffee you sort of have this morning routine um like how did you sort of like for somebody that's listening that maybe made a transition like they either got fired or something like that and they're just in a rut like that right now and they're like i don't know what to do like i you know i thought i wanted to do this one thing it didn't work out like um so like wh how, how did you sort of like work your way out of that a lot of it's mental um and i you know for me anytime we've sold a company uh you mourn it uh, when I, you know, I, I left Better Software, I think I mourned for probably about eight months. Um, took a couple of months before I even really knew I was mourning. And you're kind of paralyzed when you're mourning is the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, when I left Ruckify, I was more prepared because I had about two months to look for a CEO. So, you know, but there was still mourning because um, you're not talking to your team every day. You don't get as many emails like, you know the mm -hmm. adrenaline's gone um so you know what i did is you just do for me personally i do a lot of walking mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of exercise which is walking for me mm -hmm. and just through that like that kind of allows for clearer thinking and that is just then it's just like allowing yourself to have these ideas but also kind of knowing that you got to make one of them real Mm -hmm. Like you can't give yourself too much time because it's just going to go on forever. Yeah. So that morning, like I, I remember when I thought of bunking, I was super frustrated with myself because I had, we had gone through a bunch of ideas that, you know, I just, they, to me, they weren't big enough or, you know, they couldn't change the world enough. Like, yeah. you know, anyways, and I was just, when that happened, it was like, bang, bang, bang. I went up, I was. You're super like, excited told my wife like i got it like i know you know so yeah, yeah. That's, that's awesome then yeah. we had to register the domain name yeah. but anyways yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah but that's absolutely incredible and and one piece of advice that I, I really love about that was actually like getting out and getting like physically active and yeah. moving and doing walking like uh and like from, from like watching like youtube and a lot of other things like I actually it's it's actually surprising that like a lot of like entrepreneurs or you know content creators which are pretty much entrepreneurs now uh, they do the exact same thing. They 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 go for walks. They do like that, and it's just like a great way to like. I, I do the exact same thing, Good. and I think it's like such a, it's like you know the worst thing. Like I I, I remember when I was like in a rut or something. Like the worst thing I could do was just sit at home. Yeah, like that's Big just time. just sit at home. Like either watch TV or do. You something. fill it's up like, with anxiety. Yeah. You paralyze. Yeah, yeah. You gotta just get your ass off the couch and and, and, and do move. something. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So. Um, so to sort of go from that, uh, I, I've actually I've got three more questions for you if, if that's good. Cool. All right, awesome. So uh, one of them is actually to talk about uh, you know right now you're still in the trenches, beginning stages, um, raising raising capital, right? So you you've done that for probably over like 35 years, like I was saying, you've been in it for a l very long time. Um, what advice do you have to somebody that, you know, maybe that's watching this, they don't have the 35 years of experience that you do that they can sort of lean on. It's their first company, um, you know, and you know, they have, they got the demo product or the demo service and they've got the business plan, all that's done. They're just thinking like, okay, how do I go out there and how do I sort of sell this to people and like get them to believe in what I've so strongly believe in and, and, and get them to invest? Well, the first time I ever took money from anybody else was when we built better software. Mm -hmm. So before that, it was always like banks or self-funded or, you know, so. And that was like super uncomfortable to like go ask a stranger, you know, for money. And then like that's harder than using your own money, basically. Right. So mm -hmm. 
Uh, with better, we ended up raising, I think it was like $9.8 million. Um, Ruckify, we used VCs at better, which I didn't want to ever do again. Just the model I don't think is good for startups. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we did Ruckify, we raised $20 million, but we did it with high net worth individuals. Um, we did many rounds, fair valuations. And I literally just got off a call before you got here. Somebody was asking for fundraising advice. Um, I think, you know, yeah, I mean, you have to have a very clear vision in terms of what you want to do. Mm -hmm. I think you got to be honest with your vision. Uh, I think you have to be very careful in terms of how many promises you make because you're starting something that doesn't even have market fit. Yeah. Uh, so the guy I was just on, he was saying, well, what do your projections look like? I said, I don't give projections because otherwise I'm lying. Mm -hmm. I'll give you projections when I think I have product market fit because then I can predict, you know, how many users I'm going to get, what my sales are going to be and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, you know, we transitioned. If you look at, okay, we're in a rent anything marketplace. We transitioned to a shared marketplace. And what I started doing was activity to create momentum, which would, which would lead to opportunity, was just starting to connect with people in that industry. So mm -hmm. mortgage brokers, real estate agents, uh, landlords. So, you know, doing posts on LinkedIn, doing posts on mm -hmm. Facebook. And I've had hundreds of conversations. Every conversation, I'm just going into it looking to learn. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you're looking to learn, you're explaining your vision. When you're explaining your vision, and, you know, somebody may say, well, when are you raising? Um, Mm -hmm. I've never like with bunking. We've never, I've never asked one person for a dime. And wow, I think if you're doing a good yeah. job selling, you're never asking for the sale. Mm -hmm. You've set it up where, you know, you've done a good enough job explaining your vision, all that stuff where people ask you about investing. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so I, and that's really what we did with bunking. It was having hundreds of conversations with like-minded people, so people mm -hmm. from that industry. Uh, on the shared living, totally different than bunking ventures. So there, I have to, you know, there you're having different, different conversations yeah. to get that going. Um, and then what we did is we put a button on our website. You know, if you're interested in investing, click here, and that's what people did. And that's kind of, that's how we raised. It wasn't a lot of money. We raised two hundred thousand. Well, it ended up being I think two thirty-five uh, in our first round. Uh, now we're going to do a second round. We're going to raise another 200000 So they're very small amounts. We could go out and raise probably $20 million or $30 million. We've had VCs get a hold of us. But I think, you know, we wouldn't be able to execute on our vision if we did that. Mm -hmm. And I think we'd just find ourselves in trouble. Like, it'd be nice to put that money in the bank. Yeah. Uh, but we wouldn't build a good foundation Mm -hmm. We'd have to compromise the vision way too much to meet investor needs. Um, so it's, you know, it goes back to what I said, like, you know, action, like to go out and do stuff. Doing that will create momentum and momentum will equal results. No different than fundraising. Awesome. Okay, awesome. Yeah. So what what questions do you wish people asked you more? Uh, you know what? Well, especially when we're hiring, one of the uh, we look for three traits. One of them is curiosity, and I think what scares me is people that don't ask questions. You know, and I see that often uh, with new entrepreneurs. They get a mentor, mm -hmm. and the mentor basically tells them what to do. Never, a never spends a whole bunch of time asking questions. Mm -hmm. um, so I I have high respect for people. I don't know what what specific question. But I love people that ask a lot of questions because if they're giving me feedback, I'll value their feedback a lot more because now they have context, mm -hmm. right? For somebody yeah. just to, and that's, you know, you get in with VCs and, you know, I don't know, uh, just some people just kind of think they know your business, but they haven't even asked a question about your business. It's really mm -hmm. bizarre. Yeah. So yeah, it doesn't really answer your question, but. No, yeah. I'll, 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 I'll elaborate on like, yeah, like that, that, that was a good answer. And I, I like that. Uh, so l l let's say like in an interview sort of style right now, like when, when you've been interviewed by a lot of different people, like w what's something that you wish interviewers would ask you more um, or something that, you know, like y you were surprised that nobody's ever asked you before about. God, I have no idea. <laughs> That's a, 
just throw a wrench into it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I honestly, I don't know. Like, uh, you know, I like maybe, you know, like it's it's really talking about entrepreneurs and and it happens often like an entrepreneur will have an idea and it's always well what do you you know well what do i do with the idea how do i get started and you know it's always kind of comes back to what do you want out of it and i think that happens like in everything in life it's like you know i want to be friends with this person well what do you want out of that friendship like what are your expectations i want to start a business what are your expectations? And like, do you want to you want to be like Elon Musk? Uh, do you want maybe some more free time? Do you just want to do something you love? And I think that I don't know. Like, it's it, people being able to answer that question and have people reflect on that. I think is extremely important because it sets you up properly for what you're going to do. Mm-hmm. Right. So yeah. no point going out and raising five million or, you know, five million bucks if you just want to have a lifestyle business. If yeah. you're not prepared to, you know, don't take other people's money if you're not prepared to work your ass off. Right. Yeah. Like, you, yeah. you know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah. No, no, know, no, so a hundred percent. I I agree with that. Like, um, you know, because it's 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 not your money you're playing with anymore. It's somebody else's money that they've worked for. Right. So. Yeah. Or whatever. Like, in it, yeah. Or, you know, I want to be really rich. Yeah. OK, well, you know what you have to do to be really rich? Like. You basically have to sell your soul mm-hmm. to whatever you're doing. Like, there's mm-hmm. no weekends, there's no evenings, mm-hmm. there's probably no relationships. You know, there's a big cost yeah. to it, right? So, yeah. Anyways, yeah. that's kind of. Yeah. I have been asked in some ways, and I've answered it, but th- that's probably my favorite question to answer. I guess you would say. Ah, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I like that. Um, and this is a little bit more on a personal note for me. Um, as this, as, as I'm building this podcast and from somebody who's like outside sort of looking in on this, uh, what do you think I could do to make this podcast better? Uh, you know, maybe get more viewership or anything like that. Is there anything that you thought like, you know, like this was something cool that you should do or anything like that? Yeah. Like I, I mean, I'd have to take my own advice. I don't know a lot about podcasts, so honestly, I would have to ask you a lot more questions about what you're doing to be able yeah. to give you an answer that would deserve any credibility, I think. But just from, so that, so something that wouldn't be specific to your podcast, but we've already talked about it, and you said you're doing it, mm-hmm. is activity. You know, mm-hmm. like, you, you, I think you said you're over 100 podcasts. Mm-hmm. Right there, that tells me you're hustling. Mm-hmm. You know, that is activity. And that mm-hmm. activity has to equal momentum, and then you're going to turn that yeah. into, you know, you talk maybe about a clothing line, or, you know, you're going to turn that into something. Yeah. So that's, I, I think you're, if you've done over 100 podcasts, and they're, they're not easy to do, like, they're a lot of time, Yeah. Uh, and to do them well, you know, th- that's a really good sign, as far yeah. as I'm concerned. thank you, thank you, yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> well, th- thank you very much, Steve, for uh, coming on the show, it's been a, it's always a pleasure having you on. Well, thank uh, you. Where can people find out more about you and Bunking and Bunking Ventures, if they want to get into contact to, you know, you do another fu- fundraising round, or, you know, to just check out the services of the companies? Yeah, I mean, LinkedIn is the best, so it's Steve Cody, C-O-D-Y, uh, Bunking.com, um, or BunkingVentures.com one or the other and uh, yeah love to have a conversation awesome thank you awesome thank you guys for making it all the way to the end i really appreciate it uh if you do have a few seconds and you could write a review this would mean the world to me it helps out a lot with the podcast uh you know whatever platform you're on whether you're youtube apple podcast or spotify it helps out a ton it also brings uh you know more viewership to the amazing entrepreneurs i have on the show as well but anyway thank you guys for uh staying till the end